Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Kelly Dalbach, executive business coach for corporate executives turned business owners. I'm excited to talk about our topic today, which is 10 step checklists for any startup small business. You guys told me what was important to you in terms of starting a small business. There's lots of things to talk about, but today I'm excited to talk about um, this 10 step checklist to give your mind a little bit of a relief that there is a plan, there is a blueprint, people have done this before, and it's totally manageable, totally doable, um, aspirational, exciting, and courageous to give you a few adjectives of what I felt during my transition. So excited to be here with you today, and um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so say hello as you come in and um, if there's any questions throughout, I will be sure to address them. Um, so again, I'm here to talk today about the 10 point checklist, checklist for small business startups. So passionate business idea, what does that really mean to you? To me, that really means finding something that you're excited to get up and do every day, something that you rip the sheets off the bed on Monday morning and say, I'm gonna go help people. I'm making a difference in the world. Today, I am inspired to do my work. So a few questions that you can ask yourself um, to find your passion and understand your who is where have I experienced mass transformation in my life? Another question you could ask is what are my strengths or expertise that stands out to everyone in my professional and personal life? What would they all recognize in me simultaneously? What are you passionate about? Or what better yet, what do you do on vacation? Maybe you go sailing, maybe you go boating, maybe you love to fish, maybe you hike, um, maybe you read books, maybe you um, teach others, maybe you tutor kids. Whatever it is that makes your soul light on fire, the warm and fuzzy, I turn off of screen share, I give you the microphone and I say, speak for 30 minutes off the cuff. What comes up for you? You know, there's um, a few different things when you think about passionate business idea that I want you to keep in mind is that it's about unlocking your who, but it's not translating through an identity. And when I say an identity, that really means the personas that we pick up from society, from TV, from news, from um, celebrities, from magazines, from looking at images or um, ideas and beliefs of ideologies of who we think we're supposed to be. Not necessarily what our soul represents, but it's who we think we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be an accountant. We're supposed to be, for me, a vice president of business development. Um, you know, I did have passionate skills within that uh, title or identity, but ultimately it wasn't who I was. Next, you want to make sure that your who is aligned with market trends, right? If um, you want to build a business about butterflies, you better be sure that there is an opportunity and a way to uh, monetize or create a, a following and a product around butterflies. So, to give you some ideas and get your wheels turning, um, I've uploaded here a business idea from a business analysis or market analysis of a few of the most prop popular and profitable businesses of 2020 post pandemic um, to get your wheels turning. Social media management and marketing copywriter, those two are obviously very high on the list because of the businesses gone digital. Even if you have a retail business or a brick and mortar business or any type of um, business that has uh, land associated with it, um, you still need extraordinary focus. Everyone needs extraordinary laser focus on getting the word out, media management, content marketing, making sure that your audience, not the sisters and brothers and cousins and uncles of your audience, but your audience is getting your message. Um, food trucks, um, fast food and uh, fast service uh, restaurants, obviously anything with the to-go has been on the uh, rise um, in 2020 in the pandemic. Um, restaurants have completely changed how they serve and who they serve based on um, the, the, the market post-pandemic. Pet services, professional services, 
on consulting. Now, this was interesting. I did a um, um, poll in LinkedIn and on um, Facebook of what services most individuals in my audience, corporate executives, would start. And, and probably about 60% said consulting. Um, so it's a little over half that feel that they could leverage their business acumen and their business expertise to actually go out on their own and um, consult, whether that be for individual clients or um, for businesses themselves. Automobiles, car washing, people are taking really good cares of their, care of their automobiles. Um, children enrichment and tutoring. Think about the market opportunity for children and tutoring as they come back into um, the new normal of the school system. What does that look like? And, and how can services be catered to those individuals that maybe are trying to catch up, maybe excelled and need some um, new type of learning? And um, just that whole market has huge opportunity for innovation, um, recreation, and strategy. Vacation rentals, obviously people are vacationing in a different way. Um, they may not be traveling to Europe, but they're still vacationing. They're still finding time to get away. A per personal training, wellness, huge industry, multi-billion dollar um, industry in wellness, health, um, products, and services. And then, of course, tourism services. So after you have landed on your strategic um, and passionate marketing uh, business niche, market research is next, right? So Market research is twofold. Um, the first I would say is understanding and submerging yourself in talking to your target customers, understanding their pain points. What do they ultimately want? What would be the ideal gym? What would be the ideal consulting service? If they could pick any dog groomer, what is it like? What do they like about who they're currently using and what were they dreaming of having? So understanding their why is incredibly important in market research, is merging yourself and your target audience. You can do this in a lot of ways, surveys, focus groups, personal interview, interviews, observation, and field trips. Field trips begins to kind of step into um, the second part of market research, which is re research your competitors. Research is a good thing. If you don't have competitors, there is reason of concern to believe that um, taking market share or establishing demand of a product is going to be an uphill battle. Now, if you have a great invention, you know, different story, but it is easier to take market share from an established need um, than it is to create an entirely new market or product. Um, once you're talking to your competitors, looking at your competitors, secret shopping your competitors, and I mean from calling their customer service to ordering their product online, coming full circle um, and understanding what your competitors are doing, it's integrally important that you find the gap in the market. So finding the gap in the market will lead you to the opportunity to take the market share. You want to observe what your customers are doing, how they're reacting to the competitors. And then again, going back to your ideal clients and your target audience and asking them if they could have anything at the same price or maybe a higher price, what would that service look like? Because people are willing to pay for superior products that change their experience or in some cases change their life. Number three, a business plan. So this is the actual documents that come up when you think, okay, this is the part where I'm not clear. I've never been a CEO. I haven't even really ran a full business p &L. So what does it really look like? Well, the good news is, is um, I have a template. I have not only a business plan, but a blueprint for all of these components of starting a, a business. And the components of the business plan begin with the executive summary. The executive summary is really going to tell your uh, yourself first, but as well as anyone that picks up your business plan, why your company is and why it will be successful. So you're gonna include things like your mission statement, your product or service, and basic information about your company's leadership team, employees, and location. Um, you should also include some financial information and high level growth plan. Everybody wants to know how you're going to grow. One out of five businesses survive. How are you going to new businesses survive? How are you going to be that 20%? Now, 
Next is your company description. Use your company description to provide detailed information about your company. This goes over the problems, again, customer pain points, market research, and how you're going to solve them. So you want to be specific and list out the consumers, the organizations, or businesses your company plans to serve. Explain the competitive advantages that you have and what makes your business unique. Are there experts on your team? Are you an expert? Um, what is really going to make you stand out? Your market analysis, this goes really deep into, again, your um, ideal customers, what you've done to determine how you're going to take market share and what is going to outsell your competition. I see, you're gonna hear me say that tried and true on all of my training contents because I'm so passionate about taking market share no matter what the product is because it is my superpower. It is what I have done for corporations for 15 years. I have never taken over a business line. I have organically started with no prior knowledge in that in particular industry and mostly in healthcare of any product, but I am an expert at understanding people's needs. And that is what has ultimately led to building over a hundred million dollars in revenue growth on organic scratch start businesses. So I'm extraordinarily passionate, excuse it if it comes across very strong, but I'm so passionate about the ability to build any business if you understand the market. Operations as management is basically, if you get a customer on the top of the funnel, how is it going to translate through um, product conversion, product sale, to operations execution, product fulfillment, and then ultimately to customer satisfaction. So those are all the systems and processes that go, um, that basically follow a patient or a um, customer journey. Product line, this is your secret methodology or your secret cookies or your secret car wash recipe um, that makes your product unique. And the pricing of that also comes into line on um, understanding how to separate your, your products um, in the marketplace. Your marketing niche and sales strategy, this has to be on autopilot. It has to be running 24 seven. It has to be running when you're on vacation. It has to be running when you're sleeping. It has to be running on Saturdays and Sundays. So while you may not personally be the one that is um, doing the marketing and sales and customer service strategy for your business. Everyone needs to have a plan to address consumer needs as they come in. Funding requests, this is optional. There are plenty of small business funding options. Um, as, you know, and a good financial advisor or, your, or an accountant can help you understand what loans your business may qualify for. Or you can, um, you know, obviously personally fund your business if you're a solopreneur or um, or not, and you want to fund it yourself. Um, lastly, but very importantly, is uh, financial projections. Starting a side hustle is one thing without a full financial model, but starting a stand-up business and leaving a corporate executive job, very likely making six figures, is not feasible without a financial projection, a financial plan to replace your six-figure corporate income has to be put on paper um, as part of your planning stages in exiting your nine to five and starting a business. Number four, products and service lines. The riches are in the niches. I, uh, my business coach uh, taught me this and are actually that tagline anyway. I fully believe in this concept um, since, the, since the very early on in my sales career. Um, but people buy from experts and you have to sell to the market gap. To think about a few examples that come to mind when you say, oh, that girl or that guy or that company, they're an expert in that market. Think about Chick-fil-A. They're an expert in the chicken sandwich market. Um, you know, think about Lululemon. They, are a, they have a high-end brand um, for women's workout apparel. But you think about these and they have an expertise and, you know, sometimes their brand expands but they have a sincere niche in um, the business product and people that they serve. It breeds loyalty. People aren't buying everything in their refrigerator or in their closet from either of those brands. But when people go to buy those particular product categories, they're seeking the experts in the industry. 
So think about this. If you are an expert in digital marketing, start with a program that focuses on growing an email list. You can talk about Facebook lists and you can talk about Instagram and you can talk about content marketing down the road, but first start in targeting an audience that has that urgent problem. They need to grow their email list. Once you get them in and focus and fix that problem, then you sell and you expand your market share. But I see far too many times businesses, new business lines, companies that try and sell an umbrella category and miss out on the niche in the market. I have said no in my career way more times than I have said yes. And the reason that is, is because I've committed to the niche in the market and researching that there is a sustainable market for that niche and then built out. Then I went and sold the um, you know, plan B or plan C or plan D, but you want to start with the niche. Um, you know, a couple other examples would be if you're an engineer in construction, you market only to city roadway projects, that's your expertise. Or if you're a hairstylist, maybe you um, market specifically to blondes or you market to women with thinning hair. It's, it's more relevant to those and more, um, more relevant and more um, prominent in your marketing to attract those individuals um, to your market niche if they see their profile painted as your customer. It will go a long way in creating recurring revenue and customer loyalty. Next, you're creating your brand. So I like to start with the five star experience and work backward when it comes to the brand. And this goes back to understanding your umbrella market and then asking individuals what they would pay um, or like to improve about their current provider in X category of services. Do you notice right now people's phones are ringing off the hook? It's from your doctor's office. It's from your library system. It's from your uh, Grubhub order. People are in desperate need because they don't have the face-to-face -face customer interaction like they used to to gather customer feedback. I'll also say technology and digital surveys are making it a lot easier for customers to study consumer behavior. But spend extra on customer service, ask for the feedback, engage your customers one-on-one, -on -one, and then and then you have to do something with that information. You have to analyze and implement the consumer insights and repeat and refine the cycle. And that's a continuation. And that's how McDonald's is still McDonald's. It has continued to evolve with the customer. It's improved. It's taken feedback, um, but it's stayed in its niche. And it's, it's just um, the way to maintain a business that grows with its customers. Your marketing should be simple and clear. The average individual or the average time spent on a web page is 22 seconds. So if you have a thousand words and it talks all about your product and why they're superior, they will leave at 23 seconds. But if your statement on that page says, I have the best XYZ or I fix XYZ, and you're talking to that client, that client will, or that client or that customer will continue to, to, um, to invest in, in researching your content. Next is really your brand colors. This is just, it was just really interesting to me with understanding the science um, and strategy behind logo design and brand colors. Um, you know, for instance, I just put a couple brands on here. I mentioned them earlier. Um, red actually means active, exciting, power, confidence. Blue means um, spirit, open, ambitious, determined, trustworthy. Um, so get inspired by competitor research, personal brand or company brand. Are you the face of the brand or are you, are you, um, do you have a product brand? There are tons of options for um, logos and designs and brand colors, but don't underestimate, again, the opportunity to capture market share just by consumer research and also understanding what these colors and um, signs mean. The Lululemon name was actually chosen in a survey of 100 people from a list of 20 brand names and 20 logos. So again, customer survey, customer insight. The stylized A was um, actually made for the name Athletically Hip, which, which failed in initial brand testing. 
Um, McDonald's, it does has to do with science of the colors. McDonald's logos never change and it's withstand 40, 50, 60 years. The color red is stimulated and associated, as I mentioned, with being active. The color yellow is associated with happiness and is most visible color in the daylight. So people could see it from the highway. Interesting. Um, next, number six is make it legal. This is when I call on my superhero friends, um, my accountants, my financial advisor, lawyers, insurance brokers, right? This is things that people went to school for a long time to become experts in these categories. And I just want to encourage you to not try and figure everything out yourself when um, you, know, you can gain expert advice very quickly. Um, and if you are ever trying to be every part of your business, um, it will fail before you even get a chance to launch the brand. Um, so invest in making a network. I'm sure you have a network of all of these people. Um, it's just a matter of starting to ask questions. And guess what? People like helping people. Um, so don't be, don't be afraid of these components. Number seven, operating systems. Um, think about, you know, who's going to answer the emails from the customers on the weekends? Who's going to make sure that your marketing machine is running while you're on vacation? Um, who's going to scrub your emails for junk and, you know, pass through to the CEO, you, um, only what makes most sense. Um, who is the first employee that you are going to hire? Uh, when are you going to hire them? That really goes more into the financial modeling. But when you hit X number in revenue, what's the first employee you're going to invest in? And I say, what are the um, responsibilities you can outsource? Because marketing and sales can never move from the top of your priority list. Um, we'll talk a little bit about you know, how, how much time investing in those categories um, but you should always, if you're not individually um, talking about how to sell and market your product, um, you know, you should have somebody fully dedicated to that. And what are the responsibilities you don't enjoy? If you don't enjoy, you know, putting your business expenses into QuickBooks or payroll or, um, you know, reconciling your books, that doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be done. It does need to be done, but it means that you can outsource that component so that you can spend the time in your business doing what you love. Maybe it's creating the product. Maybe it's baking the cookies. Maybe it's um, giving the life lessons and, um, you know, how to financially become a, how to make your finances work for you and become a millionaire. Um, financial advising. Maybe it's, you know, whatever it is. It's important that you understand where your passion is. And in, as new entrepreneurs, we have to learn to do a little bit of everything to get everything off, off the ground. But once, once the revenue starts coming in, um, we'll talk about how, to, how and when to reinvest so that you can stay focused on what you, what you love. Otherwise, it's a passion turned job. So number eight, launch, grand opening. Um, I don't know if you guys can resonate with, it's been a while since we've had retail grand openings, um, but you know, they used to put things on exit signs on highways, grand opening, you used to get emails, things, um, flyers in the mail, if there's a grand opening of a restaurant um, or you know, company in the area, uh, local news coverage. Uh, the, the thing is, is that it should be planned. Um, a launch is a, a big milestone in a business. And it's important that you have a plan um, to market that because you only can be grand open. You only can have a grand opening for once, whether that be a couple of weeks and you build up to it or a day, um, whatever that looks like, just put, put intention in your grand opening. And that means everyone in your network, even if everyone in your network is never going to buy your product. They probably know someone who knows someone who knows someone that will. And one individual thinking of the spider web can spread into five, 10 conversations, um, depending on how much they like you, of course. Number nine, your doors are open, sell. Do not go in your store and start inventory. You won't have anywhere to sell it. Put your inventory if you don't have customers. Sell, 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 sell. 40% of your time should be spent selling. If you're on um, a digital business or on a storefront or um, in a food truck, understand where you're going to put your um, 
marketing and also sales efforts um, so that you have a predictable funnel. You need to talk to 250 people. You need to digitally reach 10,000 people a week. I don't know what it is. It's, it's all predictable, predictable marketing funnels that we will work on establishing together, um, but you have to have a plan. And if you don't have a plan to keep that top line number steady, your sales will do this. And sales doing this is just a, it's a tough ride. It's okay that it happens, you know, initially as you kind of, you know, sell and then have to service. But then once you reinvest, it really should only do a dip once you outsell your inventory. So we'll talk, we'll talk about that in the next and last slide. But, um, you know, your, your business goes through cycles um, when one, there is a change in market demand, which is a good thing. You've, you've sold all your seats in your class or um, you're booked out for the next month at your hair salon. Um, it's important to understand that um, the selling can never, the selling and marketing can never stop. Business development works smarter, not harder. Um, you know, sales channels, it can't all be you. You'll, you'll get hoarse if, after the first week if it's just you. Um, so establishing referral partners in the same niche and not competitors is a way to um, join a network under the same umbrella um, audience or umbrella topic or umbrella category um, that will help keep your customers um, satisfied while you, so you don't have to meet all their needs. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, you don't want to meet every single need of a umbrella category, but it's great to have reliable partners that you can refer them to when they do have the need that is outside your niche. Business development works smarter, not harder. Referral partners and strategic partners and upselling and downselling are really key components of long-term business development. It's going to help you keep your, your sales um, growing and not slowing. Um, upsell and downsell, I mentioned that um, most customers are, are going to either buy an upsell or a downsell. Um, it's just human nature. They don't want to, they want to make the decision. They don't want to buy when you sell them. Um, and so always have um, a way to give the hell yes customer even higher loyalty and either higher access and the even better package. And the customer says, hmm, I want to think about it. Um, you know, give them something for their time and their conversation um, and a, a still similar product, um, just different service category, potentially. Think about the car wash. You have the $10 car wash, the $15 car wash, the $20 car wash, and the $50 car wash. Uh, free giveaways. Getting people to know, like, and trust you takes time and relevant meeting content or relevant meeting coupons, whatever it is, come in and give your, give your shop a try. Um, it goes a long way in getting people to um, trust the newcomer um, to the business brand segment. Number 10, scale, grow, and reinvest. So you want to spend 25% of your CEO schedule planning for the next three months. You know, 40% is spent on sales marketing initially. 25% is spent on planning and content creation and strategy. So you can see really quickly where the CEO of the business needs to spend most of the time. And so if you're focused on going in and baking the cookies or, um, you know, just cutting the hair, um, it's, it's not going to be sustainable and it's not going to be scalable. So you always have to be thinking about how to grow those services and who's going to replace um, the list of tasks that need to be done outside of what you love to do. Know where you will reinvest and when you hit those financial targets, you won't even have to think about it. You'll say, oh, I'm ahead 25% this quarter. And you say, I already know where I'm going to spend it. It's going to be in this category because, you know, this, this segment of the business needs more focus or, you know, I'm going to re reinvest it in um, customer service because I know that, that breeds um, customer loyalty. Your, any investment that you put in customer loyalty will pay tenfold off of new customer acquisition. Brands make profit off customer loyalty, not new customer acquisition. Remember that. Scale or not to scale. You get to a point where you've sold your inventory, whether it's t-shirts or seats in your live training class or um, hours of consulting that you can handle. Whatever it is, you will get to a point um, that you run out of inventory. And so you decide, you scale up, you hire more people to do what you're doing. You hire people to offload the tasks of what you don't want to do. 
or you don't. That's the really great part about being your business, your business, your business, your vision, your freedom is that you don't have to scale. It's completely up to you. Um, but the reality is, is that being a business owner does not have to mean you have to give up your six figure income. It should mean that you have limitless potential and no roof, no glass ceiling, no cap salaries um, to build the business that you're passionate about. So that is what where we're um, at today. And I look forward to next week's training. And if you guys have any um, other questions, um, oh, I do see the had a question. Um, what was my most difficult point in the transition? And my most difficult point in the transition was identifying the mindset and becoming the entrepreneur um, instead of the corporate executive. I went from very task-oriented work, obviously fulfilling my task, my to-do list, exceeding expectations, to creating and planning the expectations um, and being the CEO. It's, it's just, it's leveled up. It's a new mindset. And that's why I spend a lot of time in my pro, my signature program, the five plays to transitioning from a corporate executive to CEO of your own business. All right, guys, that's um, it for today. Look forward to seeing you soon.